It's about creating conversations that you can share with other people. Arrow.net, A-R-R-O-E.net. All right, let's do it. Let's play it forward. These are real people, real stories, the struggle to play it forward. Episode number 483 is with Cassidy and Clark Freeman from Yellow Brick Road. For you guys to be on this project, I, I'm so fascinated with this. And the reason why is because I'm really good friends with Ryan Jay, who is a, an expert when it comes to the Yellow Brick Road, Wizard of Oz. So I just feel so close to what you guys are doing to this. And it, it's just fascinating. With, with how they, how this story has grown, it's true. Uh, th- this 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 uh, making this movie. I mean, what, we're, we're twelve years in now. This movie came out twelve years ago. Uh, even before that, uh, directors Andy Mitten and uh, Jesse Holland. We we would. It was their first feature film, so we had to raise awareness and money and everything else. They would have these um, French toast breakfasts on the weekend, <laughs> where everyone would come together and we'd all kind of ruminate on the script, on what version it was, on how we were going to shoot it, et cetera. So like the pre-production on this not only was homegrown, like a like a homemade Denny's, but like also lasted a long time. And and it, it, it really allowed for the idea to grow and to make sure that we were shooting the, the very best thing we could. So yeah, it's it's been a long time. For you guys, for you guys to put this in a DVD collection, I mean, my God, I mean, you, we get to talk, I mean, get to hear from actors and, and, and there's crew members and things like that. Maybe I'm a sick fool, but this is the kind of stuff that inspires me to want to even grow further with my own creativity. What, what about those that are just discovering what, what the art of this is all about? Gosh, that's really inspiring. Uh, I think anything that makes someone want to be more creative is really, really awesome. Um, Clark was just saying earlier uh, that horror is a really interesting genre because it connects the the audience is very involved. The the mm-hmm. fans are very involved in the horror. And so when you get to have a re-release like this DVD and Blu-ray where you have interviews from the cast and interviews from the crew and um, connections to the movie from years ago to be able to have that sort of um, reflection back on what filmmaking was like a decade ago, um, both for us individually and for Hollywood. I think that's so special. I think that's a really great opportunity for the fans to get to have a a, a unique and a genuine look in deeper to what the process was like. Do you think that uh, we, we, we label it a horror film, but doesn't it have to come with a definition? Because what what scares me may not scare you. What 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 brings fear to me? Because what 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 this movie right here, what the reason why it stays so true inside my soul is because it could happen. That to me is a horror film. It could happen. <laughs> that's true. That is true. It is a horror um, is a really wide swath of a genre, right? Because Sometimes people, I, I totally agree with you, but what scares someone else may not scare um, another. Uh, I love that it scares you. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I, I've become, because of binge watching, I've also become that guy that hits rewind and will sit there and say, I want to see that scene again. And then you break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down. And then you go, oh, I see why this one works. It's, it, it, it's incredible when you get to watch something over and over again and really start seeing the script through the material and you go, oh, that's so smart. Yes. Oh, they planted that scene earlier. Oh, they did that. Oh, that really paid <laughs> off or, or this or that. And I, I, just, I don't want to speak for Andy or Jesse, but I, I know Andy has said that with DVDs and things that have director commentary, that was kind of his film school. Like he would watch his favorite films and really break it down. So like you said before, the fact that Yellow Brick Road is – is doing this and, and and light your entertainment is releasing this um this blu-ray with all these special features like it's going to allow people who really love the movie to mm-hmm. dig in further and go oh my god i didn't realize this or oh my god what is robert eggers doing there as costume <laughs> designer on yellow brick road He's going to go off and have an incredible career. What is he doing with these fools? <laughs> Doesn't this kind of prove that if you have not seen Yellow Brick Road, no matter how old it is, if you've not seen it, it's a brand new movie? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And 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 to me that that's what's fun. I mean, it's like the the movie business now is the new Tower Records or Musicland. We we go into a situation like with with this DVD collection, and you're going, oh my god, I've just discovered the brand new beginning. Well, I think I think people like you're saying people that are interested in a DVD collection, people that are interested in in deepening their knowledge of a film to to spark their own creativity. I mean, those are the creators. Those are incredible. Um, fans to have those are incredible just people that want to watch the film and I think that's cultivating a group of people that are really passionate and I think that's really awesome I think entertainment these days with so many streaming opportunities with so many so much saturation in the market I think it's easy to just sort of watch things to be distracted and I think it's super fun to have uh, a project where people feel engaged 
indie movies. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I'm more impressed that you threw out a tower records reference <laughs> because I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I worked there when I was a kid for a hot minute. So I, I don't know who, who's going to remember what tower records is, but to go along with that with cast, like at tower records, when you, you know, uh, discover someone, you know, like Nirvana, you discover Nirvana and then you have to listen to Metallica and yep. Soundgarden and you have to go down this hole. So just the idea of Yellow Brick Road being a movie like that, where you can discover it and then have to discover other people makes me happy. Well, I totally get that listeners and viewers are going to do that because because that's how we're trained now, because how Netflix and Hulu, they say, well, you like this movie. I think you're going to like this one as well. And that's what I like about Yellow Brick Road is it's going to open up a lot of people going, oh, I- I've got to do that one again. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. I, I know Andy and Jesse have been at, at other festivals for other movies, and people have come up, you know, 10 years after the fact with copies of the DVD of Yellow Brick Road. <laughs> and, 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 and I've said, Andy, will you sign this, please? Because when I saw this when I was 16 or whatever, you know, 10 years ago, like, it really messed me up and it stayed with me. So I, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's awesome. So why do you think it is staying with us? And, and it really, it's one of those where you could get into a conversation and if people haven't seen it, it's like, oh, you're kidding me. Oh my God. It creates that kind of emotion from you. Yeah. It, um, uh, I think, I think it's because it takes chances and it mm-hmm. is kind of so weird. It, it, I, I, I want to talk about it without totally spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But, um, the movie takes chances in a way and takes its time and its patience that when things do start happening, it's really shocking. <laughs> and, and and you are so lulled into being with this group of people who are walking this road together that that you're disarmed by it. And, and it's not a bunch of kids at summer camp, you know, with a slasher right. guy coming in. It's it's nothing you've seen before. It's not like, oh, I know what happens here. You You go into this movie and be like, who are these people and what are they doing? And then when you get into it and you're with them, you know, 40 minutes in, when it starts hitting the fan, you go, oh my God, yep. I didn't see that coming. And weren't they brother and sister? <laughs> I, I also think I also think that um, the characters are relatable. You know, they're not caricatures. Like all of these people in the film could be you or your next door neighbor um, versus sort of like, oh, that's some star playing this part or that's some icon from history playing this part. Like it feels very, I think, in your in your living room, in your neighborhood, in your backyard. And um, that's both who was cast and also how they were written, I think. Oh, yeah. In this day and age, I mean, an entire population walking up a mountain and disappearing really seriously with COVID, with monkeypox and stuff like that. I, I would walk up a mountain just to get away. We should do a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a sequel where they're not trying to figure out what happened, but they're actually running from reality. <laughs> they're actually trying to get away. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, please make me disappear. Please. <laughs> the performances, uh, what, it, what amazes me about this is that they it's so natural. I mean, for an indie film, so, so many times when you, when you uh, watch indie films, you can hear people speaking out of tune and the, you know, the rhythm isn't really there. Not in this movie. I mean, I mean for a first-time film... Come on. I mean, they, they had some experience with this. Uh, Andy and uh, Andy and I started a, a theater company in Santa Monica okay. uh, well before this. And we all went to college. Andy, Jesse, Cassidy, myself. Actually, most of the cast of the movie. Tara, Alex. Tara, Alex. Uh, we all went to Middlebury College together in Vermont. And um, we were all from the theater department there. So we all had a language. And, and actually, Cassidy, Andy, and I are in a band together. So we have a musicality to us. Anyway, and I think that only became a cohesive unit. And that's, I think, one of the only reasons this movie worked is because we we were already a family going mm-hmm. into it. So we had to learn a lot of things about making a movie while we were making the movie. But it didn't, <laughs> it, did, it, did, it didn't sink us because we weren't just a bunch of strangers trying to make it happen. I, I, I remember, I think, one of the first, one, like the day three on set, I had a pretty emotional scene to do. And... I did it and we went hard into it. And I think it was that day that the cast, or I'm sorry, the crew who didn't know us, who were hired, who were just like, ah, we're going to shoot a movie in the woods. Once they saw the level of work we wanted to bring to it, Mm -hmm. they all kind of fell in line. And they were like, oh, 
oh, this isn't just some other stupid horror movie. This is like they're trying to do something here. They're trying to say something and let's all get behind this. So I, I think being a family really helped uh, the movie get made. How I also you- think filming it in the middle of nowhere helped. Oh, yeah. Um, on oh, a yeah. Couple, in a couple ways, like <clears throat> not trying to make, you know, the, the woods of Los Angeles look like New Hampshire, but actually <laughs> going to New Hampshire, uh, you know, Palmdale for New Hampshire. No, we like went to New Hampshire and tried to make it make it make it feel as real as possible as well and that meant sometimes that like we had locations that that we lost the day before we were supposed to shoot there um because the land was owned by someone we didn't know or you know so it was uh yeah or it was federal land or whatever so and we also had a lot of kindness of those around us um there was a family that really helped us out a lot when we were filming and lost a bunch of locations um and so that kind of camaraderie, that kind of like, you know, your your pants are around your ankles and you're like, what am I going to do now? And, you know, you kind of like, you, you have people that come and they bring you kindness. Honestly, not because they know what the finished product is going to be like, but because, like you said, they're interested in investing in creativity. They're interested in investing in what, in passion. And I think the that that inciting like feeling is is important and I think makes the end product feel uh, a lot more genuine. You talk about being uh, in the middle of nowhere. I'm from Montana. That there, there is nowhere all over that place, and I found a lot of energy being there. I, <clears throat> I always, I always thought it was you know on the corner of walk and don't walk, and to me, that's where creative energy becomes a collaboration. We are also from Montana. Where are you from? <gasps> I'm from Billings. Where are you from? Ah, oh, oh, Livingston. Livingston. Right, oh my God, Livingston, the Windy City, the true Windy City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my from God. Chicago and Livingston, so we just couldn't get away from the wind. Oh my God. All. Yeah. So you guys are familiar with the Bozeman Tunnel, then? Of course. Yeah. Oh my, my grandfather helped create that, and and so I mean, and so when I, but and I hate that the highway doesn't let you go by it anymore because I would always look over to the side of the road going up that twisty mountain and go, that's my grandfather. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, living, being from Montana, spending a lot of time there, going to school in Vermont, shooting in New Hampshire, I, you know, there is something uh, special about the nothingness. Yeah. <laughs> so now, what did you both learn from this? Because I mean, the one thing that I've that, that I've studied in, in in talking with musicians and stuff like that, the song is never done; it evolves. Do you not think this is also evolving? Absolutely. This is also evolving. We're lucky enough to be able to re-release this movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I believe Jesse got to go in and redo some special effects and tweak some things. So it's not exactly the same movie. Uh, I I think they tried to adjust things that people had problems with, not to the point of, you know, changing it completely, but at least smoothing it over to make it make people happier. But I, I also think that the art form is is constantly evolving so like any musician or actor or director will tell you as soon as they finish their product mm-hmm. project they're like oh i messed that up i want to do another one and do it better or this next album is going to be even greater or oh wait till i take this idea and do the next movie so it's constantly hopefully going upward and evolving one of the things that I learned over the weekend is the, the it's called Lights and Magic, and it was a story about George Lucas. And you don't really ever hear the stories of the way that his his studio was basically a bunch of old raggedy couches. Did you guys go through that moment too, where we all have this vision of you you superstar actors and producers and directors that you you live this lavish lifestyle, but in reality, it, it was a hole. <laughs> lavish lifestyle. Uh... No, you mean when we were actually filming this film? Oh, no, filming we it, putting all... it together, everything like that. Absolutely. Oh, no, 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 no. We were like living in a cabin. Um, <laughs> we were eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, you know, I think having worked on, on productions that do have a lot of money on different networks and whatnot, you know, obviously it feels different. But I think I honestly think the more money that you get, sometimes the further away from the creativity yep. you get. Yeah. Um, I think that when you have boundaries, whether they're financial or or logistical or circumstantial, I think that you have no choice but to lean into what you're trying to make um, and make something out of quote nothing. Uh, that to me is more is more fun too because you have a greater sense of accomplishment when you have sort of an endless uh, supply of of money. You kind of can always say, well, it could have been better. I could I could have. You know, money doesn't doesn't fix it all. Right. Um, 
I also think that people have an idea of actors in Hollywood and producing and all of that. And I think some of it's true and I think most of it's not. <laughs> with, yeah. with with your music backgrounds, what, what kept you from going in there saying, I think I can do a better soundtrack in the background. I'm, I'm more experienced, more mature in life. L- let me try this with, with this with this song or with this lay of music. Uh, because we have our uh, pillar of musicality, Mr. Andy Mitten, standing in the way, and I defer to him. And I defer to him on all things music. It's like, oh, I want Stone Temple Pilots meets Beats Boys meets everyone else. I'm just going to talk to Andy about that. I, I'll drum for him, and that's it. No, I, I, I think what that came down to to bring money back into it is I believe there were a couple songs that Andy and Jesse really wanted uh, in there that would be recognizable or at least voices that were recognizable to give it that old timey feel so they could pay for that with what money we had. And then I do know that a bunch of those tracks Andy actually made. Wow. So like th- that's him making the music and sneaking it in there to make it sound like everything else. So it just, it's another testament to him, I, I, his own musicality and, and what he can do on, on a shoestring budget. Do you, do you look at any of today's modern movies and go, Oh, you guys borrowed that from my film. You, you, you borrowed it. That's totally our film. That's a really good question. I don't think <laughs> Yellow Brick Road's been one of those things, one of those babies that you birth that afterwards you're like, Ooh, I need a scotch and a cigarette. So like put that away. So like I, I'm not gonna think about it for a while, but I, I can't think of anything like that. No, can you Cass? No, and I also think um I think that that there is only so many colors yeah if i can yeah like so we are all mixing them and we're all making them and um i don't know that even if i saw something that reminded me of yellow brick road i would necessarily be like they stole that from us i think we inspire each other yeah. you know what i mean and i think i think as long as what you're telling is coming from your heart and and what you've watched and been inspired by like you know go for it yeah. um i think what what is that what is that uh quote that um it's like the greatest form of uh, help me out here. It's Charlie. early and I'm a new mom. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Wow. So, uh, Clark, uh, I'm I'm in Kyle Petty country, and I mean uh, the, that that the big drive every year. So many people come from Charlotte to to do that ride. I'm I'm so proud of you for being a part of it as well. Of course. It, it, it it's it's such a magical time for everybody. I mean, it's a, and and everybody is invited to be a part of that ride. That's awesome. Yeah. Where awesome. are you in in North Carolina I'm, again? You're I'm, in Charlotte. I'm in Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, oh, and, cool. and you know, Motor City USA is up there in Mooresville. We've got the Charlotte Motor Speedway and all that kind of stuff. So Kyle Pett and well, the Petties have just been a major part of this community ever since I got here in '85. Wow. So, wow, 85. You went from Montana to Charlotte? Yeah, yeah. I had that big radio dream. I, I wanted to go to California, not as a nobody. I wanted to go as somebody. And I was like, I, yeah, I'm still I'm sur- still searching for somebody. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Always looking for somebody. <laughs> Charlotte's pretty cool. I'm filming in uh, in in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. <gasps> oh, my so. God. Oh, are you getting to yeah. Folly Beach or anything like that going out there to the lighthouse? Yeah. Yeah. Folly and Sullivan's and uh, trying to because it's so darn hot that you got to find some place to cool off. Oh yeah. yeah, it's not it's not down there on Market Street. Hell no, you got you every <laughs> it's not no. good. <laughs> no, it is not downtown. That's for sure. <laughs> so what are you guys gonna yeah. do uh, for the next project now? Because now you've put yourself out there again with with this. You're introducing yourself to new people as well as 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 followers and stuff like that. We're gonna say what's next. We gotta have it. What's next? Well, at least for Andy Mitten and myself and some of the other collaborators, we have a new movie called The Harbinger, nice. which just premiered at the Fantasia Film Festival in Montreal and will actually be hitting uh, theaters in a bunch of cities in the U.S. in a couple weeks. I don't know if I can say anything. I don't know if it's okay. been announced okay. yet, but um, soon, soon it will be out. Excellent. Well, you guys have got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, thank you. That's for really fel- kind. For a fellow Montanan, that, that makes yes. us feel good. <laughs> we'll, we'll meet over there at that Yellowstone River and we'll have lunch sometime. Yes, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Be brilliant today, you two. Thank you. You as well.